let's talk about John, the disciple of Jesus. The story of John is especially relevant to our times of racial turmoil. He started as an arrogant racist. You heard it. He was a rabble rouser with violent tendencies, but Jesus was willing to work with him. Over time, John mature, saw the bigger picture of God's love for all people and was transformed into a powerful hero for Jesus, sharing some of his most important messages. But um, let's start at the beginning of the story. If you met John around the time he became a disciple of Jesus, you probably would have disliked him. There are a few things worse than an arrogant young man with little self-awareness. John fit that description completely. He was a piece of work by no stretch of the imagination. He was going to be a hero. John looked out for number one and had a huge ego. He did his own thing and hated correction. On top of that, John had a temper. He entertained revenge fantasies and could be deeply critical of those around him. Hardly the employee of the month kind of person. Jesus, of course, knew all of these unflattering details about John before he asked him to be a disciple. He knew John would take time and patience to train, but Jesus also saw tremendous potential in the young man. He knew John could be a hero for the cause of God, given the right mentoring. Jesus knew John loved him sincerely. He meant well. The seeds of true greatness were there, but they were going to take a lot of watering to grow. As John matured, he proved Jesus right. He turned out to be a loyal, devoted disciple who stayed true to his calling, even when imprisoned and tortured for his faith. John's journey started with him joining Jesus' team of disciples as his youngest recruit. He was the brother of James, also one of the disciples of Jesus. John's young age, starting out, would eventually prove a blessing to the early Christian church. John would live long enough to grow very old. He would live to see the Romans destroy Jerusalem and decimate the temple. When he was old, he was the last surviving disciple with a close connection to Jesus, and this made him a very valuable resource. But let's get back to the pride and prejudice for a second. As beautiful and inspiring as John's preaching and writing were later in life, he was the kind of guy most people try to tune out when he was younger. Mark 9.38 describes one of his early missteps in which John joined some other disciples to try to forbid a non-disciple from casting out demons in Jesus' name. This kind of overreach was not part of John's job description, but he was such a hothead, he did it anyway. Teacher, said John. We saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. In response to this impulsive behavior, Jesus gently set John on his, and his partners in crime straight. Jesus said in Mark 9.40, Whoever is not against us is for us. Jesus was against unnecessary conflict and division. The patience of Jesus is tremendous. He showed us that God loves even when the bigots among us are part of the equation. We live in a deeply polarized world with clashing ideologies. There is a desire to paint those of opposing views as evil, horrible human beings. This sounds a lot like young, immature John's behavior. Just as Jesus urged John and company not to pick fights and frame people as the enemy, we today are called not to slander people that think, look, and believe differently from us. While God does not condone intolerance and bigoted attitudes, He is patient with us all, not willing that any should perish. He was patient with John and wants us to be patient with the narrow-minded types in our midst. Don't write off their hot heads. Help them grow instead. They may end up happily surprising you before long. John wasn't just intolerant, though. He was ambitious and power-hungry. <laughs> The other disciples must have shaken their heads when, as described in Matthew 20, 21, the mother of James and John pitched Jesus on letting her sons sit in positions of honor in his kingdom. Say, 
that my two sons may sit, one at your right side and one at your left side, when you are king, she said to Jesus. This kind of scheming and political maneuvering was embarrassing. But John didn't seem to know that yet. He craved the fast track. Again, Jesus reacted with patience. He asked the brothers if they could drink from his cup. Without hesitating, both brothers said that they could indeed drink from the cup. Jesus got real with them, saying that they would indeed share in his suffering. But it wasn't up to him to decide who sat where in his kingdom. That was his father's call. You will suffer as I will suffer, but the places at my right hand and at my left side are not mine to give. Whoever my father says will have those places. Jesus told him in Matthew 20, 23. Seeing this as a teachable moment, Jesus also said those who would be great in his kingdom had to be servants to the rest. That was less appealing to the brothers, and the Bible doesn't record any further reference about seating requests. <laughs> Jesus had found a way to gently get through to them and help them grow. As John was learning to be less of a pompous brat, Jesus was also helping him with his temper. If you haven't noticed yet, both John and his brother were dramatic. They overreacted to situations and were not great under pressure. Once, when Jesus and his disciples were on the road, Jesus sent messengers ahead to a village of Samaritans, asking them to get some refreshments together for him and his disciples. Circumstances must have changed, though, because when Jesus and his crew arrived in the town, Jesus decided to keep going forward toward Jerusalem. He was on a roll, no longer wanting to stop. The changes of plans upset the villagers. They shunned Jesus and his followers, not even providing common courtesies they would normally give any traveler. Unsurprisingly, John and James were furious. They blew the whole thing out of proportion and wanted blood, desperate for revenge on the foreign Samaritans. They asked Jesus in Luke 9:54, watch this. This is what they said. Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? If young John and James lived today, they would be personally responsible for half the road rage in town. Even worse, they would stoke racial tensions because of how they saw and treated foreigners. Jesus had stronger words in view of this racism and intolerance. You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man does not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The rebuke must have been strong, strong, and it must have stung them. But Jesus loved John and James too much to let them continue down their bigoted path. He is stuck with the brothers, knowing his presence could help them transform into the leaders he knew they could be. Despite his serious baggage, John was very special to Jesus. The Bible refers to him as the disciple Jesus loved. John was definitely part of the inner circle. Mark 5.37 makes it clear that only John, James, and Peter were present when Jesus raised the Pharisee's Jairus' daughter back to life. The text says, Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. At the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples, Jesus turned to John, who was leaning on him, and confided that Judas would betray him. John was one of the three that saw the transfiguration of Jesus soon before he was arrested and executed. John was at the foot of the cross when Jesus was dying. You could see the trust Jesus put in him when he gave him as a son to his mother and gave his mother to John as his own mother. John 19, 26 and 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here is your son and to the disciple here is your mother jesus cared enormously for john he saw potential in this young man the patience jesus had shown in mentoring john was bearing fruit after the death resurrection and ascension of jesus into heaven john began to more maturely step into a leadership role john was with peter 
when the lame man was healed at Solomon's porch in the temple, as described in Acts 3, 1 to 10. In Acts 4, we learn John was locked up with Peter in prison for their preaching about Jesus' resurrection. Acts chapter 8, 14 to 25 tells us that John even went with Peter to visit believers in Samaria, showing how he had matured and rejected the racism he had struggled with earlier. Verse 25 tells us how diligently John and Peter shared the good news of Jesus, saying they preached the gospel in many Samaritan villages. The strength of his conviction and sincerity, together with his experience with Jesus, made people sit up and listen to John. He was an effective communicator who wrote a lot. The apostle is credited with the book of John, three letters, and the book of Revelation in the Bible. As John grew in his leadership, he became one of the most influential and prolific apostles. The Jewish leaders hated him for how he was spreading and preaching the message of Jesus. And just as they had attacked Jesus, they sought to silence and attack John. They had him summoned to Rome to be questioned about his beliefs and set up false witnesses to make him look like a dangerous, rebellious radical. Despite this unfair treatment, John showed how much he had grown since his days as an impatient young man. He spoke with calm clarity and conviction about his faith in Jesus. Those who heard him were moved by John's words and the powerful people present were threatened. The Roman emperor Domitian had John thrown into a pot of boiling oil because of what he was saying. This is from uh, tradition and not necessarily in the Bible, but it's very possible that this happened, that he was unharmed even when he was pulled out of the oil and he would not stop testifying to his faith in Jesus. As the torture had not worked, Emperor Domitian banished John to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. But not even this treatment could stop John in his determination to share the message of Jesus. While on Patna, Patmos, the island, John got to know people there and became, who became Christians after hearing from him about Jesus. From Patmos, John wrote his most influential work, the book of Revelation. In it, he faithfully shared truths about his best friend Jesus, and he boldly shared the plans of God for the future of humanity. An old man by this point, the Bible hero showed that even at the end of his life, he was on fire for his master. Come, Lord Jesus, he wrote as he concluded the book of Revelation. John missed his teacher, and he would never tire of pointing people to the one who had changed his life. John had come a long way. As a mature Christian leader writing in 1 John 3, 2, he called both Jews and Gentile friends and said, Now we are all children of God. John may have started life immature and bigoted, but God's patience had produced a loving open-minded apostle, eager to share the good news of Jesus. Let's take after John's example, shall we, and find ways to grow in our outlook as well as in our treatment of people that don't look like us. Let's find ways to foster tolerance and awareness in our communities. Rather than give up in despair as racial tensions, anger, and intolerance threaten to take over modern-day society, Let's find ways to embrace the love and patience of Jesus as we live by example, showing acceptance and compassion for all those around us. On August 23, the African-American man, Jacob Blake, was shot by police causing widespread protests in the town of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Seventh-day Adventist Christians living in the area felt compelled to show support for their community. Rather than take up political positions and further Polarized their community, the believers gathered at a library park in the center of town to pray for healing, comfort, and peace in their communities. George Andrews III, local pastor at Kenosha Seventh-day Adventist Church, spoke at the gathering, saying that Christians are called to comfort their community. He encouraged everyone present to keep their mind on God, the ultimate source of peace for our divided, hurting world. After praying and sharing thoughts of encouragement, the Christians spread out across Kenosha to assist in community cleanup efforts 
and to pray with residents. They wanted to walk the talk and do their part to help repair the divide in their community. We can learn a thing or two from these proactive Christians in Wisconsin. All around the world, it feels like discrimination, intolerance, hate, and unrest is growing. Rather than add to chaos by fanning the flame of prejudice like a young version of the Apostle John may have done, let's follow his older, mature, and inspiring example. Let's be peace-loving, accepting Christians that care for our community. Let's do our part to promote harmony and understanding. God is patient with us, not willing that anyone may perish. This includes racists and bigots. Let's do our part to pray and inspire people to get closer to Jesus so that he can transform them. Indeed, only Jesus can transform them. Jesus transformed this young recruit, John, into a powerful leader for his kingdom. He is willing and eager to do the same in the lives of those open to his leading. I know that as you are listening to this, you're probably considering whether you have been a bigot or a racist in the past. Only Jesus can transform you and me. Only him. No one else. The solutions to our, to our polarized, divided world are not found in manifestos. They are found in a loving relationship with our Creator and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. If you would like to have a relationship with Jesus, get in touch with us. It is often very difficult to get this started. We can help you. We've helped millions of people in the past connect with their Savior, and we can help you. Just visit our website, hopetv.org, and we will be here to help you. 